So on the, um, on the first page, there are three different quotes that speak of church dedication and church buildings themselves. The first one from a author, a non-Christian author, a non-Catholic author named Annie Dillard, uh, who writes about her experience of people of faith. Uh, what, is, what is the experience that she has had of people who say they are believers in, in, in the world? And she has this to say um, about, the, um, ab about her experience of Catholics uh, and Catholics at Mass. And she goes out to say, does anyone have the foggiest idea of what sort of power we so blithely invoke? It is madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Usher, ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews, for the sleeping God may wake someday and take offense, or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. That wonderful description that she writes about the experience that she's having at Mass may be very different than what she sees the other people who are at Mass are having. She sees a church that is perhaps passive, just sitting there, just listening, perhaps walking up to the altar to receive communion, and then walking back out. But as she listens to what happens at the ambo, as she listens to what happens at the altar, as she listens to the prayers that are, that are said and the responses that can be said, she begins to say, no, something more powerful is happening here and why aren't more people aware of it? Why aren't more people realizing it? The power of, again, this space, the space that we'll occupy in, on Tuesday, the power of a space called a church and what that is meant to do, what that's meant to express. The second quote is from the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, the document from Vatican II that began the reform of our sacramental rituals and all kinds of other rituals that we have in our church, including the right of dedication of a church. Paragraph number 10 basically says, the liturgy in its turn moves the faithful, filled with the Paschal sacraments, to be one in holiness. Again, the sense of movement, kinetics. It's moving us to become something and that something is one. It's all of us together. A church is not the place for private prayer only. It's the pr place where we pray together. The paragraph continues, it prays that they may hold fast in their lives to what they have grasped in the, by their faith. The renewal, uh, the renewal in the Eucharist of the covenant between the Lord and his people draws the faithful into the compelling love of Christ and sets them on fire. Those last four words, set them on, sets them on fire, is the most, one of the most profound expressions in any of these documents that come out of Vatican II because it's so real. It, it, it should be so tangible. Every time you celebrate a sacrament in a church building should set you on fire, somehow, some way. It's not a passive place. It's not a place to sit and watch. It's a place to act, to be active, to be touched you know, by this God who says, I want you in my life, and I want to be in your life. The third quote comes from the document that governed um, church dedication and church building and the furnishing of churches after Vatican II, environment and art in Catholic worship. And it goes on to say, this is paragraphs 12 and 13. The experience of mystery which liturgy offers is found in its God consciousness and God centeredness. Everything that happens here should focus our attention on God because God is the reason why we're here. We're not just here for ourselves. We're not just here for our own needs, but we're here because God says, I want you here. This involves a certain beneficial tension with the demand of hospitality, requiring a manner and an environment in which we invite contemplation, seeing beyond the face of the person or the thing, a sense of the holy, the numinous mystery, a simple and attractive beauty in everything that is used or done in liturgy is the most effective invitation to this kind of experience. 
One should be able to sense something special and nothing trivial in everything that is seen, heard, touched, and smelled, and tasted in liturgy. That power of something that is special. Everything that happens here should be special. We should, there should be no throwaways. There should be nothing that we say, well, we don't need that, or we shouldn't do this, or, 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 or that doesn't matter. Everything that happens in, in, at the Mass, everything that happens in our sacramental rituals does matter. And so it all has to express the power that says this matters, that this is important. And it concludes, the, the paragraph uh, 13 concludes, an action like liturgy, therefore, has special significance as a means of relation to God or responding to God's relating to us. Our response must be one of depth and totality, of authenticity, genuineness, and care with respect to everything we use and do in liturgical celebrations. The sense in which to be at a sacramental rite, to be at the Mass, means that we're aware of why we're here. And we're aware of what we want to happen to us here. It, it may be surprising. It, it may be different than what we anticipated. But we come here because we want God to act on our lives. We want God to act in our lives. Um, and so that kind of consciousness of, of not just going through the motions, of not just you know, pretending to be here is, is so important. Uh, to, to give all of ourselves over to what's happening here in these places. So to look now at the dedication ritual itself uh, that you'll all experience, that we'll all experience uh, on Tuesday, uh, the first thing to note is that there is a purposeful similarity, uh, a symmetry, uh, with the rites of initiation at the Easter Vigil. Again, this is interesting that you are dedicating this church on Mardi Gras, on the Tuesday before Ash Wednesday, and you will enter the church officially for liturgy on Ash Wednesday and then take it all the way to Easter. Um, the rite of dedication follows exactly what happens without as many readings. There are, there, there are many readings at the Easter Fitchell. There, there, there's only two in the Gospel at a rite of dedication, thank God. Uh, so, uh, but it is the same kind of structure of four different parts. Four different parts. And in the, um, on the sheet, the outline of the rite uh, that you were given, it shows the parts. Um, an introduction, a liturgy of the word, the prayer of dedication and anointings, and then the liturgy of the Eucharist. You match that up against what happens at the Easter Vigil, the similarity is right there. The similarity is right there. And the reason for that is, again, because the church building is holy, it's sacred, because of what happens in it. What happens in it. And what happens in it is us. Is us. We make it holy. So in the same way that we through the sacraments of initiation are made holy, so too now the church, because it is a part of us, a part of our lives, is also made holy in the same way. It is the only non-human thing to be dedicated and consecrated in the same way that a human being is consecrated to God. So uh, to go through the right, just a little by little, by little not, to, not, not, not to tire us all out, um, uh, but uh, the, the, the idea is uh, first that the dedication takes place um, in the context uh, of the celebration of the Eucharist, the ancient ritual by which a church building uh, was dedicated to the service of the, of, of the human family so that God may instruct the human family in it. So we we continue this ancient practice of making sure that dedication always happens within the context of the Eucharist. So we begin with um, a, th these introductory rites, which are a procession. So on the first part in the, on, on the sheet that I gave you, uh, a procession. Because we are pilgrims, and pilgrims who are journeying through the life, the good life, the good things of this earth that God has given us, to something more and something greater. And so we symbolize that by beginning someplace else and moving. So um, the bishop will greet us gathered together, um, and then he will invite us to process, to, to walk over to the church. Once we get to the doors of the church, basically we will be met or we will meet there all of the variety of people who were involved with building the building itself. 
contractors, the planning committee, preparation committee, those who help to do the grounds, all these other kinds of things, Father Robert, uh, all these people will be gathered there to meet the assembly as it arrives at the doors of the church. Um, the sense in which what was done by others is now going to be given to a community of believers so they can use it for the reason why it was created to begin with. And at that moment, um, what is given then to the bishop, because all the, all the church buildings are, are owned by the bishop, by the diocese itself, so not just the keys to the church, which then Bishop Luis will pass off to Father Robert, um, but also the deed, uh, the, uh, a decree of establishment of St. Stephen's Church as, the, as, as this place as the church. All these other documents are passed over to Bishop Luis, who will then pass them over to Father Robert, uh, and basically then give ownership of the building to this community of St. Stephen's Parish. And it's important to realize, too, that some of the people who may have been involved in the construction of this building may not be Catholic at all. They, they may not be Christian at all. They may not be believers at, at all. And yet, it was by their talents, their handiwork, their knowledge, their resources that they gave of themselves to create this building. Again, the sense in which there is no separation between sacred and non-sacred, between the sacred and the profane in this world, which is why we can have, and should have, non-Christians, perhaps non-believers even, involved in the constructing of these places for us, because God is everywhere, even in a person who may say that he or she does not believe at this moment. So all that works together to show how great God is. And after all those documents have been handed over, we unlock the church. So the Bishop Luis will, Bishop Luis will unlock the doors for the first time, um, and we will be invited to be, uh, we will be invited to enter into the church itself. And once we're all in our spaces, everybody has a place, uh, a pew to sit on, a place to sit, and a place to sit. We remain standing because what happens next is again unique. Um, we go through a rite of sprinkling, a rite of sprinkling, which is something. That, oh, that, that, that should happen, that, that must happen during the Easter season. It replaces the penitential act. It replaces Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Um, it can replace the penitential act at any time except for Lent, except for Lent. It can replace the, uh, the, the, uh, the Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, any time uh, of the year. But here's how we begin taking possession of this place, not by looking upon our sinfulness, not looking upon the times in which we have failed God and the times in which we've made mistakes, but we enter into this church remembering that we are baptized. And what baptism does, it says, Christ says, you're mine. God says, you belong to me. And that should always be what's first and foremost in our minds, that we belong to God, that we belong to Christ. So the focus is taken off of us, as sometimes it, too, it is too much. It can be very much focused upon me and my sinfulness, me and my sinfulness. No, it's focused upon God. But what's also even more glorious is the fact that it's not just us, it's not just the human beings that are sprinkled with God, with, sprinkled, with, sprinkled with the water, sprinkled with God, sprinkled with the water. It's everything, especially the walls. If the ceiling can be sprinkled with water, the entire sanctuary is sprinkled with water. Everything gets doused with water. The church is being baptized. The building is being baptized, which is, which is really profound. It's a thing. It's a structure to be used by us, and yet God is taking claim of it. It belongs to God, and so it's and it's for our use. So everything is sprinkled with this water, which is why you need a lot of people to do it. So, uh, so again, this, this joy of going into this church building. Uh, there, there, there's music along with this. The, everything gets wet. Everybody gets wet. Uh, and you move basically to the opening prayer. Um, and it's a very simple opening prayer. Um, Almighty, ever-living God, pour out your grace upon this place and extend the gift of your help to all who call upon you, that the power of your word and of your sacraments may strengthen here 
the hearts of all the faithful. It's basically a, a request. It's a very Jewish request. It's basically a, a request to God that God be who God says God is. God says, I will never abandon you. I will never give up on you. I will never leave you orphan. And the, what the opening prayer, the collect, basically is saying is, God, then be that. Be that one who never gives up on us. Be that one who never leaves us orphan. Be that one who never, you know, walks away from us. But be the one who is there whenever we need you. And because you are there, again, build us up. Build us up into who, we, who we're meant to be, who we're called to be. So everybody then sits. So part one is done. Again, in the Easter vigil, we light a candle. We processed with the candle into, into, in, into the church. In this way, we processed to the doors. We took ownership of the place, and we moved in uh, with, with, with sprinkling of water. So the second part is now the liturgy of the word. The second part of this dedication ritual is hearing God speak to us, which is always what the readings are. They are not just empty, dusty history. They are not just something God is just saying up there. God is speaking to each of us here and now, in this 21st century, about what it is that God is, is for us and what we must be for each other. And Bishop Luis will introduce it with these words. May the word of God resound always in this building to open for you the mystery of Christ and to bring about your salvation in the church. May the word of God resound, that powerful word resound. It's not just may you hear the word of God. It's may the word of God continue to echo. May it continue to ring out, not just after the lector is done, but what the lector has to say about the word of God. May it take root in your heart so that it continues to shape and mold you and to transform you into the believer God created you to be. Two readings, um, the responsorial psalm, in between them, the alleluia, and then the gospel. So three readings all together, three readings all together. The first reading always has to be from the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah. We only hear from him, um, I, I think, in cycle A. In, in, in cycle A. So uh, we, we only hear from Nehemiah once every three years. But every time there is a right dedication, you have to hear from this, this, this book of Nehemiah. The second reading can be a choice. The gospel can be a choice. The first reading must always be from Nehemiah. Why Nehemiah? Why is that important to always hear from this prophet who we never really hear from? Because um, the selection that is chosen for the right of dedication is the people of Israel returning back to Jerusalem after being in exile for um, so many years, for, for, for like 75 years, 80 years. An entire generation has died, a new generation that really never knew what life was like in, in Israel has come back to Israel. They come back from exile. But the problem is, is that they've forgotten Hebrew. They've forgotten what it means to read Hebrew and to hear it spoken to them. And they think that because they can't read Hebrew anymore, that God has left them, that God has abandoned them, that God abandoned them to exile, and then God gave up on them. They were allowed to come back, but they have no God anymore. And Nehemiah, who was able to still be able to, who was still able to read Hebrew, he gets up, and he's able to translate the Hebrew that they can't understand into the language that they can speak now. And the people hear of God's love for them still, of God's mercy towards them, of the fact that God never abandoned them, and the people break down in tears. And Nehemiah goes out and says to them, remember that God is always a part of you, that God has chosen you, and God will never give up on you. Don't give up on each other. Go and rejoice. Go and have a feast. Go and celebrate. Because you have not returned to emptiness. You've returned to the God who said, I've been waiting for you to come home. It's a wonderful reading. It's a, it's a profound reading to use as the first reading for dedication of a church building because the church building should be a place where you come home to remember who and what God is and who and what you are, who, who you are before God. After the gospel, there's a homily. Um, and after the homily, we recite the creed together. So uh, usually as in a Sunday mass, so too at this point in the rite of dedication. Homily, then creed. We then move to the third 
uh, uh, to, to, to the third part, to part three um, of this dedication ritual, which is um, the anointings and the prayer of dedication. We, uh, the prayer of the faithful, the intercessions, are replaced by a litany of supplication, a litany of su a supplication, uh, where we call upon the saints to pray for us. Um, because, again, this is the sense in which this, uh, this local church of St. Stephen's, while it is new, is, again, a part of a great history, 2,000-plus years of Christians. And so all of those people who have gone before us with faith, in faith, in, uh, in, in the understanding of faith, are asked to be with us now. So the church in heaven becomes a part of this church, St. Stephen's, in Sanford, North Carolina, um, on Tuesday. Um, at, at this moment, um, to show that we are connected uh, to, to what has gone before us and that we move forward with those who have, come, who have gone before us. It's the same way in which those people who will be baptized at the Easter Vigil um, are prepared. Uh, before the rite of baptism happens, we do the Litany of Saints because we ask the saints to strengthen these individuals who will go through the waters of baptism that they will continue to be strong in their faith, to be strong in their belief. So again, the saints, not just these living people who are with us, but the people who are also living in heaven, become a part of this ritual. Again, the church being initiated in the same way that human beings are initiated. The prayer that finishes, that concludes the litany of saints, mercifully accept our petitions, we pray, O Lord, through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints, so that this building, to be dedicated to your name, may be a house of salvation and grace, where the Christian people, gathering as one, will worship you in spirit and in truth, to be built up in charity. And the whole point of being church, of calling ourselves a church, and of being in this building that calls itself a church, is first that we be one. It's always unity. Unity, unity, unity. Again and again and again but also remembering that we become more unified to the extent that we love each other. And we remember how important it is to love each other. So what we are built up in is not how much we know, you know, about how many, you know, uh, 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 how, many, uh, how many popes there have been, uh, how many gifts of the Holy Spirit there are. Uh, those are all nice little things. But we become strong and we become more unified, we become one, always to the extent that we love each other. We are built up to love. We are built up in love and by loving each other. And so this prayer concludes that this place, that this church, the church, will be a place in which people understand and, and, and experience that and live loving each other. If there are then relics to be placed within the altar or beneath it, um, it happens then next. The saints have been uh, called upon to be with us, and so the saint, so uh, a relic of Saint Stephen or other saints that will be placed in the altar uh, will, will then that that will then happen. And again, here the placing of the relics into the altar, you you need a you need a stonemason. You need someone who can be able to open up the stone altar, place the relics in it, and then be able to cover over with cement, you know, so that they stay in there and doesn't fall apart, uh, the, the relics. So again, asking somebody else who may be Christian, who may not be Christian, may be a believer, may not be a believer, to help us complete this work. That sort of connection again to the sacred and the non-sacred, that it's all one, all being used together, so that we can have a place to encounter God in. Then the major, then the major prayer uh, occurs that makes this building, or the, the building across the way, that will make that building especially uh, the building in which the people of God will gather, the prayer of dedication. I would encourage you, so the prayer of dedication you have in front of you, I'll go over it now in, in a minute, is, is, is to pray with this, um, you know, between now and Tuesday at, at home or whenever you have a moment. Um, because to familiarize yourself with this prayer is, is, is another way of really understanding what will happen, you know, on, on Tuesday. And it also increases, you know, the sense of the, the, the power of this ritual and what, and what this ritual will convey when we experience it on Tuesday. So it begins simply, O oh God, sanctifier and ruler of your church, it is right for us to celebrate your name in joyful proclamation. Again, just stating that it's good for us to be here. Today your faithful people desire to dedicate to you solemnly and for all time. 
that sense of consecration. It's permanent. Even if use ceases as a church, as a place of assembly, the space is still dedicated to God. Uh, people came up to me at the break. We do not undedicate churches. Some of our uh, Protestant brothers and sisters have rituals of undedicating, of, 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 of desanctifying a space. We don't have that because once it's claimed by Christ, it's claimed for all time. What happens in there is, is what's important. Um, so this social space will be just another place for the people of God to gather, even as it has been consecrated at one time to be a place of assembly for mass. The second paragraph, this house brings to light the mystery of the church which Christ made holy by the shedding of his blood so that he might present her to himself as a glorious bride, a virgin resplendent with the integrity of faith, a mother made more fruitful by the power of the spirit. The church belongs to Christ. The church gets its understanding from itself solely from Christ. That second paragraph sort of wants to affirm that and, and make sure that we realize that. The third paragraph, that the church is holy, the chosen vine of the Lord, whose branches fill the whole world, whose tendrils, born on the wood of the cross, reach upward to the kingdom of heaven. The sense in which what this building does and who we are in it has a purpose here and now in which we live and also for what it is that we will gain, you know, once we move from this world to the next through death. Is, again, this building functions in two ways. Sometimes people just thought it was a way of only getting to heaven. Uh, but no, there's a lot of work that needs to be done here first before we do the heaven business. And the church wants to remind us that this building is function for us to function here uh, first and foremost, how we live in this world, in this time and place. The fourth paragraph, blessed is the church, God's dwelling place with the human race. Again, a place in which God dwells, not the only place but a place in which God dwells with the human race, a holy temple built of living stones, standing upon the foundation of the apostles with Christ Jesus as its chief cornerstone, taken from the gospels, taken from the, uh, fr fr from the epistles, a temple built of living stones. Again, Munichius Felix, the little Felix man, again, talking about us, be the us being the temple of Christ, of the Holy Spirit. We are the ones, we are the stones, the true stones that make the church the church. This serves a purpose, yes, but we ourselves as believers are the, are the, are the most profound um, part of what it means to be church. The next paragraph, um, it just goes on to speak about what the church is. Again, exalted is the church, a city set on a mountain for all to see, resplendent to every eye with the unfading light of the Lamb, resounding with the sweet hymn of the saints. That fifth paragraph, it uses the word church, but it's speaking about us, not just the building, not just the building. And by the time you get to the sixth paragraph, that's finally where we finally ask God to send his spirit to make this church, to make this building you know, into the church itself. Therefore, O Lord, we beseech you, graciously pour forth from heaven your sanctifying power upon this church and upon this altar to make this forever, again, permanence, to make this forever a holy place a table always prepared for the sacrifice of Christ. And then it says, it uses the word here. Is it a key? What is, uh, is it? Uh, a key, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for the next paragraphs, all begin with the word here, a key. Um, the blessing over the Paschal candle um, on, on, at the Easter vigil uses the phrase, this is the night repeating again and again and again. This is the night when Christ rose from the dead. This is the Christ, this is the night in which death is defeated, you know, by love. This is the night in which Israel uh, escaped each Egypt uh, through the Red Sea. This is happening here. This is now. This is the echo of what it is that God does. In the same way that word here is to meant to reinforce what this place is to be a place of divine grace where it overwhelms human offenses. That seventh paragraph, to be baptized means to be overwhelmed, not just washed and cleansed, but to be overwhelmed. To be overwhelmed by what? By God's love, by God's love for us. So again, being set on fire, as the Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy said, is what we're supposed to, what's supposed to happen in this building. 
that we are to be overwhelmed, set on fire by God's love. Again, and it's, it's what it's doing is in these next paragraphs to the end of the prayer, it's, it's re-emphasizing what happens in the sacramental rituals that will occur in this church building. To so be overwhelmed by baptism, to hear, hear, hear your faithful gathered around the table of the altar, celebrate the memorial of the Paschal mystery, be refreshed by the banquet of Christ's word and body. It speaks of Eucharist. Here may the joyful offering of praise resound with human voices, joined to the songs of the angels, and unceasing prayer rise up to you for the salvation of the world. Whenever you celebrate um, a marriage or an ordination, the sense of people taking on a witness of their lives to whom what God is in this world. Here may the poor find mercy, the oppressed attain true freedom, and all people be clothed with the of your children, come to the Jerusalem which is above. That second to last paragraph talking about penance and anointing of the sick. All these sacramental rituals that will happen here in this place. How important it is to have a place for those sacraments to happen in, to take place in. And then, as in the Easter Vigil, um, an individual would be baptized. Uh, at, at this point, we've already sprinkled the entire space with water at the beginning of our celebration, and so now we do the second thing that happens after baptism is anointing. And so chrism is then used over everything. Again, everything gets messed up. Everything gets wet. Everything gets oil spread all over it. The altar first, and then all the walls. And it should be all the walls. Sometimes we just limit it to just little places on the walls. But the whole wall should gleam. It should, it should all shine uh, with that oil. So again, um, the idea that salvation is messy uh, to be, because people would say, why are you anointing the walls? You're going to mess them up. You're going to get them dirty. Who's going to clean the wall? We don't care. Uh, let the wall shine and let it smell. Again, chrism is a scented oil, and so let even the walls smell like Christ, because that's the whole point of chrism. You're anointed with chrism so that you smell like Christ smells, and the scent of that oil is, 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 is representative of Christ. So even, again, let the walls of this place, let the, let the altar itself smell of Christ. Then, something very interesting happens. The, the whole place, so we've, we've splashed it with water, We've spread oil all over the place, and then now we make it smell even better by smoking it up. Um, incense. The whole place is then smoked with incense. And the most amazing thing about it is upon this altar, which you only think bread and wine, nothing more, we place a bowl which goes onto the altar, and we throw charcoal in it, and we put heaps and heaps of incense on top of it. So it's this smoking bowl of incense. And then we get the thuribles, and you use a lot of them to keep going up and down and all over the place, uh, 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 blessing everybody with the incense, blessing everybody with this fragrance. Again, another fragrance of Christ, and the fragrance of Christ. And what's wonderful about that incensation, again, it's something that we often don't think about when it happens at Mass, at, at a Sunday Mass, you, after the altar is prepared with the gifts, you can incense the bread and the wine, you incense the priest, but then many times a person comes out and incenses the assembly, incenses the people. And why are they doing that? Well, it's basically showing that you need to be here, that it's good to have you here, that you should be here. You know, you may look at yourself, I'm a sinner, I do everything wrong. No, you don't. Not, not that wrong that would pre prevent you from being here. And so we're going to make you smell nice. And so to walk, go up and down, walk up and down with this, with this incense to show that God is already present in you. God has been present in you. And that needs to be honored. And that needs to be ex ex acknowledged. And so the incense everywhere, everywhere. The last thing that happens, so it begins with the litany of the saints, then we move to the prayer of dedication, then we anoint everything with the oil, we throw the incense everywhere, and the final part of the dedication, part three, is to light the candles, light the candles, to, to illumine the church, finally. And that is a profound final part of this third part, because there is a 
uh, a statement that Bishop Luis will say when he sends out people to light candles everywhere. And usually there will be a candle at every space on the walls where oil was placed. Um, so all of that is illuminated. And Bishop Luis will say, let the light of Christ shine brightly in the church that all nations may attain the fullness of truth. Reminds us, we are not a clique. We are not a club as believers. There's no such thing as the Catholic club, although there are some people who want that to be. Um, we are here for the world. We are here for everybody, whether they believe or not. We are supposed to be lights in this world. And the lighting of the candles is reminding us that all nations, Christian, non-Christian, may find what it means to have truth in Christ, may understand what it means to be loved you know, by Christ. It's basically a powerful sign uh, that Christ, the light of the world, has taken possession of this building. After that, um, again, it, it, there's been a, enough in that third part, uh, you know, but after that is done, mass continues as usual, only in the, but in, in the sense that uh, the liturgy of the Eucharist uh, follows at part four, part four. But it's not usual because this is the first time it's happening um, in this spot, in this place, in this new church. The final thing, the final uh, piece of the dedication rite then is after communion, after communion, um, the uh, inauguration of the chapel of the most blessed sacrament. Um, uh, now it could be a chapel separate from the church building, or it can be a tabernacle where the reserved sacrament will, will be placed. Um, but the way that the bishop will do this will be in the same way that we take the blessed sacrament on Holy Thursday, after the Mass of the Lord's Supper is completed, to the altar of reservation. But here we don't take the blessed sacrament to another altar, we will place it in the tabernacle or, or, or in a chapel, but it's an imitation of what happens on Holy Thursday. And once it is placed into the tabernacle and it is incensed, the Blessed Sacrament is incensed, that is when we light again, or, or light for the first time, uh, the vigil candle, the sanctuary lamp, uh, that will remain always lit um, at, at the tabernacle. After uh, the reservation and the, after, the, after the reservation has been done, after the Eucharist has been placed in the tabernacle and has been blessed, there is a final blessing. Um, which is, uh, which again is supposed to help us remember what happened in this ritual. That it just isn't over, but it's now beginning something new and different. Uh, may God, the Lord of heaven and earth, who has gathered you today for the dedication of this church, make you abound in heavenly blessings. So again, you're here for this. May it constantly bless you. May it constantly be part of your life. May God, who has willed that all his scattered children be gathered in his Son, grant that you become his temple in the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. So again, it echoes again the fact what Felix said, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that we are uh, the temple of Christ. And may, you be made through, and may you be made thoroughly clean, so that God may dwell within you, and you may possess with all the saints the inheritance of eternal happiness. The three blessings are addressed to everybody who is there to remind them of their duty as Christians in the world, as believers in the world. No one comes to understand who Christ is or is not in the best way, but through, through our actions. That, that, that we are the ones through, through whom somebody will know who Christ is, or maybe who, who they don't know who Christ is because, because we fail to act uh, in, in the world as we should as believers. People don't get to know who Christ is through a book, People don't get to know who Christ is because they follow some rules or some regu regulations. People come to know who Christ is because of us who say that we believe and because of the place in which that belief is constantly reaffirmed and strengthened in us. The blessing sends us out to remember that we have a mission, we have a responsibility to bring people to Christ and to help them live lives um, that are worthy and enriched because of being brought to Christ.